lot of times people say, oh, you're such an artist, those sorts of things. And mm -hmm. For me, I know I'd rather be known as a craftsperson. Mm -hmm. What I think craft is basically a repetitive function against a resistant material. Mm -hmm. That's what I would consider craft. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do any craft, but uh, wood turning is definitely a technical craft and I appreciate it for that and right. I, I, you can mix art in with it but I don't want to do that I think we talked about it before too you'd rather make something that somebody appreciates in their home and doesn't have right. to interpret what you make I mean what makes me fulfilled as a craftsperson is the actual fact that people use my stuff right mm -mm. no <laughs> well, I'm right again <laughs> I recently visited my friend Mike Mahoney in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of California where he and his wife Jenny have a farm. Mike is a wood turner, primarily a bowl turner, and one of the most prolific bowl turners in the industry. He's also a farmer, winemaker, tree hunter, and birder. When I started 10 years ago, Mike was somebody I idolized in the field and hoped that one day I might get to meet. He is well respected all over the world, not only for the quality of his work, but also for his teaching and demonstrating abilities. This was an exciting day for me to visit his home and studio and share a bit of his story with you. And I got to learn something. Mike was showing me thread chasing, a way to turn wooden threads by hand on the lathe. Thread chaser there, the Mike Mahoney thread chasing tool. Mm -hmm. So you're learning from a guy who has no tools. <laughs> Wooden threads are something most people wouldn't expect to see in a turning, so they can be a great way to step up the quality of a piece, usually a turned wooden box or an urn. While there are jigs that can be used for threading, I'm a big proponent of doing as much as possible by hand. It's more rewarding for me as a maker and I think adds value to the final piece. The first time I saw thread chasing was an Alan Batty demonstration at the North Carolina Wood Turning Symposium in 2009. It's something I've been wanting to learn for quite a while, and I couldn't think of a better place to learn or a better person to learn it from. Well, I have to say, pulling up to this place, the landscape is incredible. Yeah, it's pretty it's neat. Absolutely it's gorgeous. Cool. Yeah, when we first came here, um, I saw these big walnut trees, um, and I was very impressed, and that was sold me on the property, <laughs> no doubt, for sure. So how old do you think this is? You know, it wouldn't be as old as you think. It's probably, I'm going to say, probably 140 years old. That's about when the first white man showed up in this valley. Mm -hmm. So I figured they planted this. So one thing that um, I know that you do as a hobby is you, you hunt for trees. Big you trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, matter of fact, the biggest uh, Clara walnut tree is about 10 miles up the road. Mm -hmm. That's a national champ, so I look for national champion trees. Uh -huh. um, this is probably about, this would be about the fifth largest one that I know of. Yeah, so um, tell us a little bit about how you decided to live in this particular area. Well, you know, I grew up about 40 miles west of here mm -hmm. in a small town, and there was a river that ran into that town called the Kasumas River, and mm -hmm. I live right on that river now. Mm -hmm. And I always, when I was a young kid, I wanted to live in the foothills because uh, I, I think it's a beautiful area. These are kind of golden hills right now, but mm -hmm. in wintertime, it's as green as Ireland. Yeah. And in the summer, it turns brown. Uh, and where I live, there's an abundance of nature. Um, I have you wouldn't believe the amount of birds that I have here. And we have bears and mountain lions and unfortunately a lot of rattlesnakes too, but mm -hmm. uh, we know how to handle those. So we're good at And birding I know is another hobby Yeah, bird's of yours. a hobby. Yeah, I'm a bird nerd too, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. That usually turns people off at, at dinner parties. <laughs> they're still pretty young, so they're, um, uh, they won't really produce till they're about a dozen years old, but these trees live uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh, I cool. think they're originally from uh, Persia, uh, 
maybe Afghanistan area. But um, uh, these are, I planted these trees when they were a quarter inch and maybe 18 inches tall and six years this is what I've got. And a lot of these trees, like this is a, this is a female pistachio and you need a male to create this, the uh, nut here. And the male, I got a male over there. Uh, but what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm combining the trees. I'll be cutting off a piece here and attaching a male branch there so it would have a pollinator right on, on itself. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. So the kiwis are a fluke of evolution. So they, they don't use flying insects as a pollinator. Um, they have, in where these are from, they rely on a crawling bug. So. Uh, a, a bug has to crawl on the male flower and then find its way over to a female flower to pollinate it. But I don't do that. I actually put my finger in the males and then I just I rub all the flowers. <laughs> and so I, I pollinate this. Otherwise, we would never get fruit. Yeah. So it's always a chore around here. Yeah. We grow most of the food. We eat what's, what's seasonal. Jenny um, provides flowers for some local wineries. Yep, she makes flowers us? for wineries. She's got a pretty extensive flower garden yeah. here, and it's really not full yet, but she'll have a lot more stuff here soon. Mike and I have met up at a number of different places across the U.S. over the past several years at various wood turning symposiums and events. There might be a brief moment to catch up and then it's off to the next place. It's not often that we have the chance to work on a piece together or to nerd out and share some of the intricacies of our own processes with each other. So this was really fun, a chance to break things down step by step to talk about the how and why for each of us in bowl making and in business and to just make something for the fun of it. Mike Mike Bowl, first, mm -hmm. first ever. Limited edition. That one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, should I get all the equipment for tasting wine? So here we are in Mike's workshop. As I mentioned earlier, he is a winemaker, so he's going to tell us a bit about how he got into that process, and we're going to try a little sample here. Well, I've always made wine, as an, as, even as a young adult. I uh, never made it good, probably because I lived in Utah for so long, so it was hard to get good fruit. But now, <laughs> living here where grapes grow everywhere, I get a lot of neighbors just let me go pick. and then. Uh, as you can see, by, I've got a couple barrels over here, a couple barrels over there, and uh, they're different vintages, and I just play around. Let me show you. Mm -hmm. um, so this right here, this is a Grenache, which is my f eh, second favorite grape. My little turkey baster here. <laughs> Let's taste it. So Grenache is a wine typically used here uh, as a blending wine. Um, I love it as a varietal just by itself. You want to taste it? So it's very light in color. It's a great lunch wine sort of thing. This one's young. This one's about, uh, it's only about seven, eight months old. And you can taste the, it's kind of really acid. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's some really high tannins yeah. in that, typical of this type of varietal. Mm -hmm. But I think that's pretty good. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And I got 55 gallons of it, and so that's 
250 bottles, so cool. um, <laughs> plenty of wine around here. Yep. There it says Stu's theory, 40 degrees times RPM divided by diameter. And oh God, who knows an infinity symbol? Infinity symbol there. <laughs> All this stuff. And Mike's theory, one plus two plus 80 grit, good enough. <laughs> Most people know me as a bowl maker, and that's true. But in reality, um, I've made an income by selling roughed out bowls and roughed out pieces to other wood turners for a long, long time. And I actually make a better hourly wage by making those pieces. As you can see, every table has something underneath it. This has a, a grade scale 4A, which is the best quality. And then a star means I'm going to keep it. <laughs> I don't let the ones with the stars go away. And I'll, okay. and I'll make it. But I, I sell these to other wood turners. So about how many, um, about how many roughed out pieces are you selling a year, would you say? Uh, about 400 bowls. And then I'll have about, uh, I did about 480 of these this year. Mm -hmm. I, don't get, I don't have time enough to ever use it. Oh man, you got a pool table? Oh, this is this is top, top stuff here. Yeah. Why have we not been playing pool? Are you a pool player? Yeah. Oh dude, I am like the best. Proficient enough to... Oh, look at that. <laughs> so many people, it just happened to you, you made them a bowl. And they, they put it on a shelf somewhere and they look oh, at it and I go, don't do that. Yeah. Use it in your everyday life. That way yeah. I'll be part of your life. Right. You know, you know all of us, Glenn, uh, Richard Raff, and all my friends, I have their bowls and I use them and I think about them all the time because I'm constantly using their work and mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the best stuff. God, you left me nothing. What do you mean? There's nothing Can't here. you take the 14 all the way down? No. Perseverance is everything in craft. For me, I treated my shop or my business uh, as a business, and I was, and unfortunately, as a self-employed one, I worked seven days a week for ten years. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you're self-employed you're almost always working. But again, if if it's what you love, you don't mind working because right. it, it's cool. I mean, what I do is, yeah, I'm just incredibly fortunate to, uh, and you got to know that too, because I've got other siblings that are craftspeople as well and I don't think they appreciate what they do sometimes as much as they should because uh, you know just to be self-employed is, is pretty cool. I couldn't agree more. To be able to make a living making things, working with my hands is a privilege. Part of being a craftsperson for me is how it ties you to the rest of the world. Whether it's wood turning, farming, wine making, cooking or anything else, not only does it tie you to the physical world, but also all the other generations of craftspeople who have developed their trade and have shared what they learned, whose hard work and knowledge have laid the foundations that are here today. Mike is one of those people who I am honored to know and call a friend. His work continues to have such a huge impact in the wood turning community and yet he is one of the most genuine, warm-hearted people I've ever met. Someone who I think epitomizes what it means to live as a craftsperson. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see here, please hit subscribe. And if you wanna make sure that you never miss a video, hit the little bell next to the subscribe button for notifications. I'll see y'all next time.